Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. Uh, Jamie here from NOLA and uh, this week we've got uh, Ian Schmidt from Iniquity coming in for a chat and this is going to be the first in a series of interviews called Legendary Whiskey with Whiskey Legends. Ian. I'm flattered to be called a legend, that's good. Thing. <laughs> You've made my day. You've made our day by coming in. Uh, so we're going to start off with a few quick questions for you and then we'll get on to drinking a dram of your choice. Go for it. What made you make the switch from making flagpoles to making whiskey? I've been making flagpoles for about 37 years and if you've made flagpoles, thousands and thousands of them like I have, it's not much of a, a decision to make. But it started when my mate Vic, who's my business partner, and I were leaning on the school fence perving on the yummy mummies one day waiting to pick the kids up. And he said, he's a chef by trade, but he delivers mail for a living. And he said he delivered mail that day to a homebrew shop and they had a stool for sale. And he thought he might buy the stool to go have and make some vodka. And I had a stool, which I'd inherited from my father and he had inherited from his father before him. And I said, don't bother going and buying a stool. I've got one, bring your booze around and I'll just do it at my place. And that's where it started. And then one day, a few years later, I came home from a hard day of flagpole installations. I've done thousands of erections. <laughs> and erecting flag poles can be a hard yakker and my wife said be getting too old and too decrepit and too fat to put flag poles up for a living. Why don't you do something more sedentary? And I said, like what? And she said, I don't make whiskey. And even now today she says it's the only thing she's never had to tell me to do twice. <laughs> so that's how it started. Do you have a preferred style of whiskey or a particular region that sort of sparked it all off for you? I really got interested in whiskey after going to a tasting of Abelau. And Vic and I turned up to this tasting and they started us off with a Chivas Regal. And I thought, oh shit, Vic, this is good. Vic, Chivas Regal, good whiskey. And it was. And then we had an Abelau 10. And I said, I'm never drinking that Chivas Regal crap again. <laughs> the Abelau 10's fantastic. And then we had another big number with the Abelau, which was even better. I forgot what the number is. And we finished up with an Abelau Abuna which was just wonderful. And Do you remember what batch it was? It's only batch two or three. Whoa. It was really early. It was bloody beautiful. I bought a bottle there and then. It cost $100 or $105, which was a lot of money in those days. Uh, but I loved it and it probably... I squeezed it out for three or four years before I finished it. Yeah. So that sherry style got me into it, but I like them all. Apart from your own whiskey, do you drink a lot of other Aussie whiskies? I don't drink Tasmanian whiskies unless someone gives them to me because they're too bloody expensive. Uh, I do like to drink other Australian whiskies to benchmark our own against them. Of course. And I drink as many as I can. Um, I don't get much lime burners, although that's an interesting whisky. Sometimes it's really good, sometimes it's not. I do get to drink a bit of Flurio because mm. Gareth sometimes exchanges a bottle yeah, with me. Yeah. And I like to benchmark against Flurio. Like to would like to put one out I think is inferior to his. <laughs> We have some fun times, Gareth and I. Uh, I drink Tim Boone occasionally, I drink Baker's Hill occasionally, Starwood occasionally, which is actually remarkably good for the dollar. Uh, yeah. Do you think uh, Australian whiskies are sort of developing their own style now, or is like following a particular trend in flavour? There's been some interesting stuff written about that just lately. Uh, it's been suggested that a lot of whiskies are made in barrels that are too small, and they stay in the two small barrels too long and they get over oaked. And a lot of people call that an Australian style, whereas some people in the world call it an Australian fault. Um, I like the over oaked, well not over oaked, but heavily oaked, full of tannin sort of whiskies because I was brought up on Barossa Valley dry reds. And if you like a Barossa Valley Shiraz that's got a bit of oak and a bit of pepper and a bit of bite to it, then you like that Australian style of whiskey. But yeah, I think there is an Australian style. I think it's full flavoured, full bodied yummy, scrumptious, it's got some balls. A bit like our wines. <laughs> so where did the name Iniquity come from and what does it mean to you? Iniquity means what it says in the t-shirt. So, it? gross injustice, immoral, sinful, wickedness, and the alternative meaning is uh, seriously good single malt whiskey. I there think we go. can all appreciate that. Iniquity means, as it said, immoral, unjust, and some, but it's a bit naughty, it's a bit cheeky, and it's a bit sinful. And the biggest sin of all is that something so really nice and lovely is actually bad for you. <laughs> if you do the research, there's this many medical papers that tell you it's going to kill you. Yeah. 
And there's this many that say, maybe in moderation on the right day of the week, the little bit won't kill you too fast. Another thing that's wicked and sinful is that something we make from a few hundred dollars worth of grain that the farmer gets at the farm gate, $300 a ton he gets. A ton of grain will turn into $29,000 worth of excise for this government. Wow. That's sinful and that's wicked. And that makes our product very expensive. It makes everyone's product very expensive, actually. So, uh, when you arrived today, I asked you what you would like to drink, and uh, after a pretty short discussion, we settled on the 33-year-old uh, Milton Duff. I think it was based on the most expensive whiskey in the place. <laughs> well, it's not quite. Uh, this one, normally, we sell at NOLA for $72 a nip. But well, it's more a, than I can afford, so I'm happy to try it. For a 33-year-old uh, Speyside whiskey, that's really... Uh, sort of mid-range, I guess. Anyway, um, I'm getting thirsty. I don't know about you. I should probably drink some more. Nice to notice that there's a few floaties in there too. Yeah, I mean... Non-chill filtered whiskies. Non We're not the only filtered. people who do that. Alright, let's have a look at this. It smells pretty lively for a 33-year-old whiskey. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely up there. 50.5 is the ABV on that. And uh, we don't know a lot about it, other than it's a single cask, uh, ex-bourbon American oak. I don't know, do you want to go first? No, I'm still sniffing it. <laughs> I could take half an hour over this. I don't know, on the nose it's quite spicy, maybe just a bit of, bit of citrus. A little bit of honey, but not, not like Balvenny, not a strong honey. I think it's terrible. I, th I don't think you should have that in the bar anymore. I'll take it home for you. <laughs> um, I like that a lot. It's very youthful for a 33 year old. Mm. It's quite lively. It's got honey notes and the sort of thing you'd expect to get from a fresh bourbon barrel. But it's quite concentrated by being there 33 years. Yeah, quite quite light and floral for, for yeah. a space site. It's almost <laughs> more indicative of like a Highland style. Well, I thought space side were Highland. <laughs> it is, but uh, you know, I get it's, it's own region for I get certain pine characteristics. Do you get pine? Pine needles? Yeah, maybe a little bit, but not not green pine needles like forest floor. Well, it's quite. It's not burning on the palate, but it's a little hot. I'm gonna try a little squish. Oh. It's just warm enough to let you know it's fifty percent. Kind of kills the nose for me. <laughs> the water or the fifty percent? The water. <laughs> but let's see if it changes the mouthfeel. Gee, it has, hasn't it? Yeah, the palate's definitely opened up a lot more to like green fruit and and, and floral. I'm not enjoying it as much. No, me neither. <laughs> I wish I hadn't had it any water. You're right, it's opened up <laughs> the, the palate, but the nose has deadened it. Yeah. And I'm just not enjoying it as much. Anything else to taste? Oh, I do have a little surprise for you. Oh, good. So we've been aging some uh, whiskies in our own uh, 16 litre barrels in our own private collection and cellar. And about 14 months ago we we bought 20 or 16 liters from Ian here and uh, it went into uh, one of those casks that we had seasoned with musket for six months so I do have a little splash here for us to try and it really does smell like one of your whiskies straight away obviously a bit quite Quite rich from those musket casts, from the from the musket. But I think it still has that chocolate honeycomb that people refer to seeing in your whiskies all the time. That has really picked up the musket notes. It's huge, but it's starting. To, I think it's starting to get a little bit bitter at the end, a little bit too much tannin coming across. It might be time to get it out of there soon. Uh, you're right. This would be sensational on ice cream. Yes, absolutely. I often put whiskey on ice cream and desserts, 
as you can tell, I like my desserts and my ice creams. Um, yeah, that'll be sensational. It is delicious. I can't wait to uh, get it in some bottles and start selling it here at the bar. Well, uh, thanks very much, Ian, for joining us today. And uh, maybe in a couple of weeks, we'll come down to Tin Shed and uh, do a little piece down there. Please do. Cheers. Slunch. Slunch. Remember, everyone, there's no such thing. <laughs> there's no such thing as perfect whiskey. This is strong. <laughs> it is.